Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are going to be recording this session today. Um, I'm Madhuram Dekar, and I'm a community engagement manager at Crossref. Um, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to today's community call with Crossref, the Retraction Watch leadership, and our other special guests. Today's call is a follow-up to the announcement on 12th September about Crossref's acquisition and opening up of the Retraction Watch database, which is a significant step towards the pursuit of research integrity. If you have a question during the, during the call, please write it in the Q&A box so that it's easier for us to keep track and for everyone to be able to see your questions and we'll be able to field the questions to our panelists as well. We hope that this will be an enjoyable and productive meeting for everyone and we expect everyone to hold to the Crossref code of conduct. I want to start by giving a brief overview about Crossref Retraction Watch and also introduce our panelists for today. Crossref is a not-for-profit membership organization that works to make scholarly communications better. It makes research objects easy to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. Crossref offers a variety of uh, services and initiatives that have always focused on documenting the scholarly record and making it easy for the community to assess the trustworthiness of scholarly outputs. Retraction Watch is a blog and a database whose parent organization is the not for profit organization, the Center for Scientific Integrity. Retraction Watch started as a journalism blog with an aim to cover stories about research integrity and scientific corrections. The Center for Scientific Integrity, which has been funded by the MacArthur Foundation, the Arnold Foundation, and the Hemsley Trust, has also built a comprehensive database of retractions and other amendments to published articles. Both Crossref and the Center for Scientific Integrity have a shared mission to make it easier to assess the trustworthiness of scholarly outputs. And as a step in this direction, the Retraction Watch database has been acquired by Crossref and made publicly uh, openly available. I want to briefly recap some of the salient points from this recent announcement. Uh, as I said, the Retraction Watch data and the database has been acquired by Crossref and made a public resource. Retraction Watch will continue its work under the Center for Scientific Integrity. The full data set has been released through Cross Crossref's Labs API, and it's available initially as a CSV file to download directly. An additional aspect of the agreement is that Retraction Watch will keep the data populated on an ongoing basis and always open, essentially providing a service together. This initiative is complementary to publishers registering their retraction notices directly with Crossref and using Crossmark, which is, which is very important. Both organizations are clear that publishers remain the primary steward of the scholarly record, and this new data will be able to augment publishers' efforts. To share more on this development, our panelists today are Rachel Lemmy, who is the director of product at Crossref. Ivan Oransky, who is the co-founder of Retraction Watch and executive director of the Center for Scientific Integrity. Jody Schneider, who is an associate professor of information sciences at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign School of Information Sciences. She is the PI of the Alfred P. Sohn Foundation funded research project, reducing the inadvertent spread of retracted science and a public voices fellow of the OPED project. We also have Michelle Avisar Whiting, who is the program officer for Open Science Strategy at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Jennifer Heimberg, who is the director of the Strategic Council for Research Excellence, Integrity and Trust at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in the US. And last but definitely not the least, we have Chris Kraft joining us from the publishing house Springer Nature, where he is their research integrity director. To begin, I want to go around to each panelist and request them to share in one breath what their first reaction was when they first heard this news. Um, can I can I start with uh, Jody maybe? A dream come true, <laughs> really amazing. Oh, fantastic. Uh, what about Ivan? Uh, what were your thoughts when this agreement was finally out? Well, you know, I actually quite, uh, similar to Jody's, I guess, probably from a somewhat different direction, but uh, we've been uh, obviously uh, Crossref and Traction Watch have been working on this for some time, but it's uh, it's a it's just very much the perfect collaboration. Uh, it's the two uh, sort of right groups to work together, uh, so mission driven, so focused on helping do all the things that uh, you you mentioned earlier. Um, so I I was really happy. I, I did say I, I was telling. Uh, uh, at least one, a couple of Retraction Watch colleagues as this was really coming together, 
um, I remember we, we used to have our calls on Fridays and, you know, and, and the weekend after it sort of really became clear, like, oh, we've got something here and, and all that. Um, I, I remember kind of being a bit euphoric because it's such a big um, development, uh, not just for Refraction Watch, but for the scientific community. So, yes. Great. Uh, can I ask Rachel next? Um, I'm I'm going to go with relief because I'm really bad at keeping secrets. Um, as Ivan said, you know, these conversations have been a long time in the making and obviously just grateful to everyone involved, a lot of whom are on this call for, um, you know, pulling together the, the conversations, the information um, and the thinking and some of the onus behind making this happen. That's that's perfect. Um, can I ask Michelle to share her thoughts next? Sure. Um, I don't always have a positive response to news of acquisitions, uh, but this one definitely hit different. This is like watching two people you love get married. <laughs> so uh, I immediately knew it was going to be good news for everyone. That, that is an interesting way to put it. Uh, how about Chris? What did you think when you heard the news? Yeah. Yeah, well, my, my, the, what I wrote down to my answer should be, will be, wow, right? But um, I've been waiting for something news to be announced. One of my team members have been speaking with Retraction Watch about the data that the uh, Retraction Watch database held back in January. And I think, Ivan, you said to her, uh, yeah, wait, there's some big news coming. So I was like on the edge of my seat, waiting for whatever this big news might be. And and, and, then, it, and, then, and then, of course, it was announced. Um, I've got me several reasons why I'm completely delighted. Uh, and But you said in one breath. Um, so I might hold the reasons why. I'm, no, I won't. I won't. I'll, there, there are multiple reasons. Um, we, we don't uh, have robust data of our attractions as part of the infrastructure, the complex wiring we use and all rely on. And bringing together the two organizations really helps create that. And I think that's really good for both organizations, sustainability for Retraction Watch, richer data for Crossref. I think that's great for publishers, really great for publishers. Maybe we'll talk more about that later. And I think that's really great for research as well. So, you know, I mean, I can't can't find any downsides. So that that's sort of why I said, wow. Thank you, Chris. And last but not the least, I want to ask Jennifer on her thoughts. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess my initial thoughts were that, you know, the the good work, the great work started by Ivan and his team um, raising awareness on this really important aspect of our scientific process had found a natural home and uh, a great place for um, further changes to take place to continue to improve the quality of our scientific uh, products. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, let's now head and discuss what's meant by retraction. So for this, I want to hand over to Jodi, uh, and I request her to share uh, with us briefly about what retractions are. So retraction is supposed to be a mechanism for correcting the literature. When uh, something is really seriously flawed, there's an error, um, there's data that can't be, or findings that can't be relied on, um, lots of different reasons that that, that, that happens. Um, this part of correcting the record, this is why I'm so excited about this partnership, um, because we're not often correcting the record. Um, there, it's a relatively small number of articles retracted, maybe one in, in 1300. It's across all fields, and the data across fields has not been so easy to get a hold of in general. 60% right? of retraction is in engineering, for instance. Um, Reasons for retraction include unethical research, redundant pu publication, issues with data, issues with results. And I have to stress that retraction is part of a healthy science and healthy research ecosystem. Um, honest error also leads to retraction, and that's part of the process of doing robust science. Um, it can take uh, varying amounts of time for uh, publications to be retracted, could be 40 years could be days, could be months. Um, and unfortunately, even when the results are wrong, people may continue to cite and use retracted publications for a decade or more. Um, and, and that's what this can help with if we if we take it. So that's that's it from my side. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Jodi. I think that was a great introduction and set the stage for what's to come next with our great panel here. Um, I want to move on to Ivan next. Uh, Ivan, can you tell us a bit more about the impetus behind setting up Retraction Watch and how it has developed over the years since its initial launch? Sure, happy to. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be brief because I think I, we all want to get to questions and discussion. Um, so I, just by way of very... Uh, hopefully quick, as I said, uh, introduction and, and sort of the history. Uh, Adam Marcus and I launched, uh, we co-launched uh, Retraction Watch in uh, 2010. So about 13 years ago now, a little bit more than that. Um, and we had two basic sort of premises, sort of reasons for doing it. One was that um, these were great journalistic stories. Uh, Adam had broken a big one, which I won't get into now, but you can look it up. Um, and I just thought there's a lot of great material here. And as journalists, you know, finding stories like that all the time is just, it's terrific and, and important. Um, the other thing though, was that we found that retraction notices, um, mostly we were concerned with how sort of opaque and, and often unhelpful they were, um, not exclusively, but there were a lot that really felt that way and looked that way. And they were also hard to find. Um, that part of it though, to be honest, didn't really pick up until several years later. So for a couple of years, it was just me and Adam, we were writing a blog, it was fun get to do kind of what you want as a blog, especially when you don't even have, you know, any structure, you know, any any sort of corporate structure or anything else. And then it became clear to us that third reason, if you will, that we couldn't f keep up with other attractions. There were a lot more than we thought there were. We were wrong about how many there were. And, you know, we just, nobody was keeping track of them. Um, you know, all the places that, that should be, uh, or sort of you would think would be, we're having trouble doing that as well. So that gave rise to the idea for the database, which uh, we didn't, we started work on actually in late 2000, really in 2015, um, didn't launch until 2018. And we always need, and we were, we had generous funding as was mentioned earlier, um, but operational costs are always the, the real, you know, sort of uh, holy grail, uh, you know, Mount Everest of nonprofits, right? And of trying to maintain data, not just sort of do a data set, send it out to the world, which we fully support. And so we have had a model of, of licensing the data, as, as many of you know, and as Chris alluded to, I mean, uh, uh, Springer Nature, others have either approached us about it or have uh, integrated it, which is great. Uh, Zotero and um, uh, EndNote and other bibliographic management software, Edifix, which is sort of, you know, in that line of, of doing uh, work like that, manuscript management. Um, and that's terrific. And, and we really hope that's already had an impact. And we're so grateful to those who have licensed the data to get us to this point. Um, but when this opportunity uh, came along, and again, I, I just want to say that, uh, and, and Rachel alluded to this, and, and it's hard for journalists to keep secrets too, Rachel, as you know. Um, but, you know, I, and I'll, 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 I'll sort of call out uh, uh, Lucy, who has, uh, Lucy Ofish is on the, on the call as well, um, who spent many, many hours uh, on the phone and emails and, and all sorts of things. And uh, internally, of course, as well. And and also Jeff uh, Builder, and I don't want to leave anyone out, but I, I do want to call, uh, just point out uh, those two in particular, because um, Jeff has been uh, a a great uh, sort of supporter and, and helper to Retraction Watch for years and has helped us think about the database, helped us think about what we're going to do, um, what, you know, everything that that really was so useful to us. And, and in many ways, Jeff sort of, over time, Jeffrey kind of you know, uh, at different points, we would reconnect or we'd talk about what the options were. And that, that you know, I love organic processes. Uh, and this was really a, an organic uh, sort of thing. Um, uh, Michelle, I really like what you said about sort of two people you love getting married. I don't think my wife's on the call. So, I'm, I'm uh, I, I, you know, she and I are married and we still love each other. Uh, but this is a sort of professional kind of marriage that I think is just really, really terrific. Um, but over time, as I think you all know, uh, or many of you may know, um, again, the, 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 there's been a growth in interest in attractions. Um, this year in particular, I, I sort of say this every couple of years, and then I sort of go, oh, but that actually was not even the peak yet. Um, both in interest in attractions, Marquesse Levine, Francesca Gino, I could go on, lots and lots of interest, uh, you know, as you know, as you all know right now. But I just want to sort of leave you with some data. Um, this is actually sort of new and fresh data. And Jody, I think uh, directionally your 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 sort of uh, estimate was correct, but in fact, 
right now, it appears that about one in a thousand papers are being retracted. Um, again, that, that isn't surprising. It's been going up. Most of the reason is because of scrutiny and because, um, you know, there are groups now, publishers that actually uh, you know, are looking at these issues and, and all of that. Um, happy to discuss that more, of course, during the discussion. But the uh, but they're definitely on the rise. This is a rate of retraction, just denominator being the um, uh, sort of overall uh, scholar, um, science and engineering uh, indicators, like a uh, uh, number of papers published. Um, again, been on the rise. Pay no attention to that dip. Retractions tend to take a while. We have no reason to think it won't continue to rise. Um, but again, it's still one in, in a thousand papers. That being said, it is a signal event. It is a, a very important event, right? Um, it's not a sort of random blood test that you that turns out to not be important anymore you really need to pay attention to the fact that something's been retracted um and so it's important even though the relative size of the database it's only about 40,000 43,000 in our database another you know 14,000 with some overlap uh in what was existing at Crossref so relatively small numbers in the you know millions and millions tens of millions of papers published uh but important data on the rise um we're so pleased to be able to you know, continue the work and to only improve the database. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much, Ivan, for sharing that. Um, I want to next invite Rachel, who has led this initiative from Crossref, um, and it, which has been the culmination of several conversations over the years, to give us an overview of what Crossref's plan is with the data. Cool. Thank you, Madura. And I think, as said, as Ivan would say, it's there have been a lot of us involved from the um, from the from the the Crossref side, and as you said, um, Lucy has pulled together details that are um, that are hard hard to come by. And uh, but you know, it's it's been a it's been a good and I said a good sort of discussion in getting to this point I think what I wanted to highlight was um I guess what we are seeing at the moment at Crossref and I think that's a nice compliment to um what Ivan and Jody have highlighted in terms of the what we're talking about the the volume of information that we're seeing um and Maduro you've already done a much better job at me than um at at introducing Crossref so I'll I'll keep this keep this going um at Crossref, we are um, our board voted um, in 2020 to endorse our support for the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. We want to work in open ways. We want to make the information openly available so that it can um, so that it can um, provide maximum benefits to the to the community. Um, and I think we all know that you know that. The journal article is is just one piece of the information about um about research or or the work that um that a group is doing um and we we collect and have metadata that that, that aims to give kind of a wider picture so this kind of re rich and reusable open network of relationships so connecting research with the um with the process, the related data, the identifiers that really help build up a bigger picture of the work. And I think that's really important, you know, whenever we're talking about being able to being able to read around or infer the the integrity um, or the information behind a different uh, a piece of research, which sort of rolls into this vision of the um, of the research nexus, which we've talked about on community calls before. But I think just that kind of wider um, that wider picture and that um, those links that exist between a piece of research and the wider context that it exists in. So being able to build out information on things that happen to a work post publication, and especially something as important as retraction information, seem very much in in scope with with working towards this goal. Um, we've talked about, um, Maduro, you used the free sort of augmenting um, data that we get from, from Crossref members. Um, we think this is really important. Um, and we, as of, I think about a week ago in our API, we could see just under sort of 14,000 um, retractions in the metadata, which, which has been provided by our members, so institutions, 
publishers, library publishers, right across the board. But we knew that that was a, you know, a, a small percent based on the the number of retractions that Ivan and his team have have found, collected, and distributed over the years. Um, it's key that this information is machine readable so that it can be integrated into the types of tools and services that Ivan has already mentioned. Um, and we'd been thinking over time, you know, how can we, you know, how can we reinforce that this information is important? How can we incentivize, you know, our members to provide it? And, you know, we expose it via our um, via our open APIs. We show it um, via the crossmark enabled fields as one of the, I guess, kind of the the twelve key metadata fields that we sort of encourage our members to provide via our participation reports. And we used to actually charge an additional fee for registering this crossmark piece of the metadata, and we removed that in twenty twenty because you know charging people extra to do things that we would consider best practice didn't seem like best practice on our side. Um, and I think the other thing, um, Jody might mention this too, is that again, several of us are involved in a NISO, NISO initiative um, that aims to publish a recommended practice, hopefully in the next month, um, to encourage the, to, to build out recommendations and how to communicate this information downstream because if we make this information openly available, it lets people build interfaces, tools and services or add functionality to existing tools. Um, there's obviously the, the process of notifying people downstream when um, when a publisher is retracting a work. Um, that's often quite a manual process. It could definitely be more automated. And, you know, teams like Jody who are actually, you know, like Jody's team that are doing research into this. Um, but I think the point is that the, these use cases can really only be enabled if the information is comprehensive, high quality and open, because otherwise you run the risk of making, you know, of, of false positives. So making an assumption that something hasn't been retracted when it has and that information then perpetuating downstream through the through the literature. And that's something that we want to we want to avoid. Um, reiterating this piece, we've got this in the FAQs, but there are a couple of pieces, um, thanks to Martin Eve's work, that mean that we're able to, to make this information available now via our labs API and via a CSV file. And we are doing, um, we're starting to think about the work that um, that we'll that we're going to do to to integrate the retraction watch data into our into our REST API. Um, the main thing we'll have to do about that is model the data. We're working towards a metadata model where it will be much easier and clearer when we're ingesting information from a third party to show who who's making the assertions about the data. But we need to model that carefully and we'll share that out with the, the community as we do it so that we can get feedback so that we can, again, make the information as useful as possible downstream. So I want to leave time for discussion. Um, and I will, so I'll hand back over to you, Madeira, because we we need to also have time for the, the questions that, that we haven't answered yet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing all of that. And to get the discussion started, I think it will be interesting to understand what this development means uh, for different stakeholders or the different communities that they represent. So I want to start with you, Michelle. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on what this development means for funders? Sure, I'm happy to. So I think funders are going to benefit from for the same reasons that all the other ent entities um, will mainly the merging of two large databases of retractions means that we'll have a more comprehensive and reliable information source for, for any application. What those applications will be in practice uh, for funders remains to be seen. I know both anecdotally and from studies that funders by and large haven't made tracking of retractions a part of their review process. Um, this is a little strange to me given that the majority of retractions are related to misconduct and you'd think um, a funder would want to know if their money was going um, going toward potentially fraudulent or or an unethical research. 
Um, but perhaps that's exactly because it hasn't been totally intuitive finding that information. Um, after all, most people still think retractions are extremely rare. Um, and of course, if they end up getting a lot of attention, like some of the ones that Ivan already mentioned, especially when they happen to high profile researchers, then retractions due to misconduct um, could lead to temporary debarment from funding. But the application that I think is much more important, certainly for us at HHMI, is not the punitive one, but the one that's concerned with reward and recognition, if you, if you will. Um, Dorothy Bishop wrote this great piece actually in Retraction Watch several years ago, where she said that the most important thing funders can do is to value reproducibility as a criterion for funding research. So things like re uh, requiring registration, open data and code, reporting of negative findings. But I think retractions and certainly other forms of post-publication correction play a, a huge role in this, um, particularly if it's the authors, you know, initiate, initiating those actions themselves. It should be viewed as an act of integrity for authors to correct the record on their publication. It should bolster confidence in that researcher, uh, and they should be rewarded for doing that. Uh, we know that the community broadly agrees with this because the data show that authors who self-report errors don't suffer the same citation penalty on their work uh, as authors who don't self-report. But we know that it's also you know, as rare as it is for funders to track down and, and take into account retractions due to misconduct, it's even less common for them to seek examples of self-correction. So in the main, this idea of you know, self-corrections of the research record don't factor into funding decisions, but I do expect that this is going to change now because there's been a shift. You know, I think everyone has felt it. Um, there's a shift in emphasis in recent years away from uh, someone said being right and toward getting it right. In other words, a growing interest in leaving behind the superficial me measures of impact and looking at um, indicators of reliability, rigor, and integrity. Um, as one case in point, before I stop, the 2017 revised code of conduct of the um, all European academies lists giving credit to authors for issuing prompt corrections post-publication among its good practices in research publication. I do think we'll start to see more of that, um, especially with this development. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Michelle. I want to go to Jennifer next and would love to have your thoughts on this as well. Great, thanks. Um, I, I would echo uh, most of what Michelle said. It was it was great and a, and a good way of thinking about how incentives um, uh, need to change, but are also beginning to change. Um, and so uh, at the within the Strategic Council of uh, Research Excellence, Integrity and Trust at the academies, we are interested in looking at retractions from uh, many of the angles that uh, Michelle had, had, had mentioned in terms of incentives, efficiency, just change the goal of, 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 of getting it right versus being right is, is such a, is so powerful and clear. I like that. Um, but I also wanna talk about how change and sort of this the strategy of culture change um, that has been promoted by Brian Nosick. I'm sure many here know who that is. And um, uh, he supported open science and he's identified sort of a reverse pyramid of how to make change. And the first step is to make it possible, which is to make sure there's infrastructure to um, to, to allow it um, to happen. And certainly Crossref offers that, the infrastructure that's needed. Next, make it easy, make it normative, make it rewarding, and then make it required. And I, I this is such a, a good step towards that process. And um, uh, I, I think there's a lot of work to do still uh, to make it um, normative and re rewarding and required. But I, we're, I think we're, we're getting there. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, I want to ask Chris next, uh, how about publishers? I think they have a really key role here. So what do you think this means for the publishing community as well? Yeah, thanks. I, I I love the comments that have come before about being right and doing right. Um, but bef before reflecting a little on those, I, I think I want to be a bit selfish and talk about why I think this is good for publishers. And I think it's good for publishers because you know it it brings visibility to the work that we do post-publication. 
And one of the things that publishers bring or should bring to the research endeavor is long-term curation and caring about something that looked right at first glance, but that a couple of years down the line, you worked out wasn't right and needed to be addressed. So it brings well, well-earned uh, visibility to that kind of effort. And for me, it um, emphasizes the value that publishers can and do add to research integrity when they do that. So that's the sort of selfish bit. Um, less selfishly, I think it brings sustainability to a really important organization, the Retraction Watch database. So I'm delighted about that. Um, and last of all, uh, perhaps again, a bit selfishly, um, dare I say it, actually the, the data is there to, to, to say it for me. C cross ref data on retractions is about 14,000. Retraction watch data on retractions and post publication things is, I think it was about 40,000. So what I was trying to dare to say that perhaps metadata could be better, <laughs> but the data say it for me, particularly that's true with respect to post publication events like retractions. Um, I believe that the Retraction Watch database is sort of manual curation of that post-publication data across all of the publishing sort of sources that there are out there is a really powerful activity. Again, I'm glad that that's going to be sustainable now. Um, I'm even more glad that it's with Crossref integrated into the kind of, I may use, use the analogy, complex wiring that Crossref pro provides. It connects us all together digitally, all these important items of research output together. And um, now cross now Retraction Watch data is part of that complex wiring. And that's pretty cool, right? Um, and from my point of view, uh, plugging that data into initiatives that the whole industry is putting its shoulders behind, like the STM Integrity Hub, that I um, uh, chair the governance board of that, um, is, is really, really great. Um, now we'll have one place to look to get the data that we can then use reliably to enhance the tools that we're making, perhaps to enable retractions to be quicker, right? That would be good, wouldn't it? Perhaps to enable us as a sector to prevent problems in the first place. And I, I think that's awesome. So um, there you go. Thank you for the question. It was a good one. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for that perspective. Uh, another thought that comes to mind is now that this data is open and it's freely available, um, who do you see using it and for what kind of applications does uh, does this development make sense? So I want to start with Jodi, if you can uh, share with us what you think can be done with this data. Uh, it's great that people have already talked about open data as someone who is doing research about retractions. Um, the latest paper I have um, has data from four places. <laughs> But only one is the, only the Crossref data is is data I could share at that point. If I were writing that paper today, it would be two. It would be Crossref, the you know, original Crossref data and the Retraction Watch data. So that's that's the immediate. Um, there are um, there are two kinds of research projects that I've done in this space. One is kind of data analysis, scientometric oriented projects, and those have been absolutely possible. Um, Ivan and uh, his you know, center have made it very easy for researchers to use the data freely. Um, but there's a different kind of data that, uh, you know, uh, data use that has not been possible up until this announcement. And that's digital library projects. That's when, when we want to share the data, use it and, and do something with it. And so one example would be uh, again, uh, Kabanek has a problematic paper screener um, and it shows us what he calls feet of clay. What are the things that are building on retracted papers, which is exactly the thing that I want to know. Um, today, um, you know, immediately as soon as the, the data became available, he integrated the retraction watch data in. Um, and so now we have the best possible data that we're that we're using for for that. Um, but um, when when this data was was locked up, under a, a license agreement, one of the things the license agreement would say is you 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 know you have you have to make specific provisions if you're going to share. So so that research um, would not have have been possible um, not to share. So it's great. It's really great. 
Thank you so much, Jodi. That's that's great to hear. Um, I want to go to Rachel next. Um, similar question. What do you think can Crossref community members do do with this data now? Um, I think Ivan, you can probably talk to this a little bit as well because I think we know that. There are folks in the community who'd been working with Retraction Watch to um, to subscribe to the data in the past, and there's certainly crossover with um, with folks who are in um, who are working with Crossref who maybe already um, are using the the information that we make available via our um, via our APIs to be able to to integrate the the data. Um, you know, examples might be um, bibliographic management software, which is which can then, you know, you add a citation, it flags up the information that it that it knows based on the DOI to tell you maybe that, you know, that a paper has been retracted. That's one area. There's the research that Jody's doing. And then obviously there's the um, we mentioned the NISO group. And we've been talking a lot about the folks who aggregate the information. So abstracting and indexing providers, et cetera. So if they can get the information, more comprehensive information from one place, they then they can integrate that. So again, if you're doing a search in one of those um, databases, then it's easier for them to integrate and flag if a paper has, has been retracted. Because I think what we're all saying is that we don't want to remove this information. We don't want to, we don't want to scrub it from the record. We just want to be transparent about what's happened and, and why. And I think this, um, we hope that this will enable that. And I think Michelle, to your point, it is also something then that that you know that that funders can rely on more confidently whenever what you know when they're doing their um their work or thinking about the directions that their policies might go to in future. Um so I think lots of things that I would say you said the the questions that we get most about using the crossref data isn't, you know, about maybe how to query the API or you know, response rates or things like that. It is we're looking for this information and it isn't there. Um, so I think with this, a lot more of the information that people will need need will be there and, and available for reuse. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Ivan, would you like to add something to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really would just amplify uh, and, and sort of maybe elaborate a little bit on uh, on some examples uh, of everything that everyone's mentioned, uh, you know, in particular. So we've always thought about uh, scholars uh, who study retractions, people like Jody, uh, of course, um, as a, a key uh, constituent, if you will. And so there are hundreds of papers. I mean, we're, we, we're just sort of, frankly, overwhelmed, literally overwhelmed, because we can't keep track of all of them, but uh, also sort of emotionally overwhelmed that uh, so many uh, scholars have done such amazing work. And and use use the data set. I mean, we sort of thought that would be the case, but it's much grander and bigger than we even thought. Um, we end up peer reviewing some of those papers, which is sort of a little bit of a circle back or something. Uh, so that's one core, and, and I just see that exploding because you know the fact that they don't have to contact us, and then I don't have to talk to their you know maybe attorneys at the university. I mean, it's just it's honestly it's a time drag. Like I, I we had to do it, I, I, and I was happy to do it, but. Boy, that I, I literally will have hours left in my, you know, back in my week that I don't spend doing that stuff, um, and it's just better at anyway. Uh, second, in terms of uh, again, what you call them, bibliographic software management systems or uh, manuscript management systems, like now everyone can just, you know, you should not, right, be able to try and cite or even read or or even like sort of see glancingly across your screen a paper that has been retracted without learning it's been retracted doesn't mean you shouldn't read it i mean you should do whatever you want but like again i mentioned uh, zotero endnote uh, papers um third iron uh, edifix they're already all using it um and and actually helped us make the data better in many ways and so now everyone can use it uh whether they're a nonprofit, for profit, anybody can use it. It's all there. Um, I do want to just, and, and I'll just uh, try to just quickly and to be brief, but uh, Michelle mentioned, um, I, I think, I don't want to get what you said wrong exactly, but there was something about, you know, you're, you're, you're surprised or, you know, you, uh, you know that, that more funders weren't making use of the data. Uh, I can't say who, but there is a, a pretty significant funder who um, has uh, licensed the data for that purpose of kind of just, again, some combination of checking people who might be applying for grants, as well as 
again, more proactive, but more positively, I would say, and, and, and forward in a forward way, like, oh, what do we want to be funding? And, and sort of what do we know about this? And is this a good signal? Um, universities have also uh, licensed the data to um, really do background checks. That, that's a little bit more a little more discreet than maybe negative, if you will, but important. Um, and so another, for example, uh, people can now make things public, as Jody was saying, not just in the scholarship way, but uh, there's a site called uh, retractions.au. Um, they licensed the data, basically all the data from Australia and New Zealand and created their own map and uh, sort of visualization. Um, anyone can do that. Now. In fact, someone saw that site. We talked about it a bit because it's, it's a bit of a partnership. It was a bit of a partnership there. Um, and uh, someone else, I think in France, but somewhere in Europe, you know, said, oh, I'd love to do that. I said, and I'd love to give you the data. And like I said to uh, Chris's colleague uh, back early in the year, like, just give me a minute. And uh, and now they know they can use the data. So it's just, it's it's terrific. Thank you so much, Ivan, for that. Um, I want to now move on uh, to some questions that are coming in. Uh, we already have a few questions that are coming in the Q&A box. Um, so the first question is, uh, it's, a, it's from Diane, and it says that this is great news for research integrity. We are exploring adding retraction data to get FTR API entitlement responses. Is there a set of cross-mark user interface guidelines that our users discovery tools would need to adhere to? Um, can I ask uh, Rachel to maybe take this one? Yep, I can. Um, the So we do have, I think for Crossmark, it's worth saying we do have um, display guidelines and sets of logos that people can use to, to integrate it. Um, but I think, I, I guess whenever I, when I, it, obviously with the kind of display of the information, the consistency of the display of the information is useful because then anyone who's reading a paper, you know, is familiar with what's this button, what does it do, what can I find out whenever I click it. Um, but I think the the thing that so so I think it's worth looking at those. Um, but overall, I think you know there's the there's the in, there's the display interfaces. But I think that the most important thing is, you know the information is computer readable via APIs. So as you said, it lends itself to being able to use be used in those responses. And I think the other thing that we would all say is just make it as make it as clear as make it as clear as possible. Um and and that serves the downstream purpose. Thank you, Rachel. I, I hope that answered Diane your question. Um, we have another question. Um from Michelle, uh, so, I'm sorry, from Michael to Michelle. Uh, Michael is asking, are there any specific references you recommend for researchers self-reporting errors? So I think I think if I'm interpreting that correctly, they mean uh, re reporting errors on their own work. And in my opinion, that should happen through the journal. I know that journals don't always make that easy. And so maybe this is my plea um, also to journals and publishers to please make it easier for people to correct their own record. I've had to do it on one of my own uh, papers where I completely forgot to change numbers in, in the abstract after I uh, did the, the revision and it wasn't caught by the reviewers or by the editor, but I caught it later and really wanted it to be changed. But the only way to change it was to issue uh, a comment on the uh, on the paper, which isn't even possible um, on a lot of publisher sites. So even that that minimum um, you know intervention uh, isn't isn't possible at the time. And I think that that's really problematic. I don't really understand why you know in this in the digital age we have the ability to version, um, and so people you know I think publishers should be embracing that those those requests and um, and featuring them prominently. Sorry if I've misunderstood the question though. Thank you, thanks, Michelle. Um, we have another question uh, from Hari Nandini. It says, congratulations on your partnership. Um, would it be meaningful or possible to classify retractions into two buckets in the database, whether the retraction was due to honest error by any of the involved stakeholders? 
or due to willful misconduct by any of the stakeholders? Um, is this data already available? Um, Ivan, would you want, would you like to comment on that? Sure, no, uh, great question. Um, and the, the short answer and the probably most useful answer is uh, it is already available uh, depending on how you classify on it, or I'll go back to that. Uh, our database has always had, the Retractor Watch database, excuse me, has always had um, a taxonomy of reasons for attraction. It's actually one of the things that you literally won't find in any other source of data uh, because it's not, it, it's sort of created by Retraction Watch and added there. Uh, the taxonomy, as some would say, and I, I would actually probably agree at this point, is a bit too granular um, for, for a lot of purposes. Uh, we think it's useful and people should group however they want. Um, I will say just to, and, and, but again, if you go on the, you download the data and uh, you can sort by all sorts of reasons. Again, there are usually more than, there's usually the, the, the devil's in the details. So one is, one thing is that there's almost always more than one reason for a given retraction and we code those uh, that way. The second is um, the whole notion of honest error. Um, and I do want to uh, sort of call out uh, someone I really should have called out uh, earlier uh, as I answer this question, who's uh, Alison Abritus, who is our research director at Retraction Watch. And, um, you know, whatever credit uh, Retraction Watch or the Center for Center of Integrity uh, deserves or, or is getting for uh, this database, uh, which again uh, is, is part of what has been acquired, really it belongs to Allison. And, and, and I mean that like about 98%. Um, if, if we were a scientific paper, um, I'm not sure I would qualify for authorship because all I went out and did was try and get some money from people, right? Um, I'm being a little bit self-effacing because that's what I do, but but Allison really has uh, been just the brains, the the effort, the muscle, and and all the work behind this. But she, and the reason I mention her is that she um, uh, sort of has a lot of problems. It's probably there isn't an honest error category in the database uh, because that's a complete. It's a judgment call that, frankly, based on available information, except in extremely rare cases, uh, is is sort of not fine. Is not available. Um, so again, you can look at it, you can triangulate, you can sort of make reasonable estimates and guesses. Um, but I think much more interesting, or not, not much more interesting, but I think much more evidence-based and much more uh, sort of useful is to, to really dig down into what the issues with the paper were. Because honest error, you need to literally have someone say, either I committed fraud, which most people don't typically do, which would be the opposite of honest error, or here's exactly how this is honest error. And then people have to judge that for themselves. So um, yes to lots of a big taxonomy that we hope is really useful, um, not necessarily to honest error, just because it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a difficult uh, sort of thing to, to suss out. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ivan. Uh, there's another great question here from Alex. Um, can someone speak to the difference between what is or what will be in the Crossref Labs API? versus what will later be in the metadata API. Assertion provenance was mentioned, as well as the pending uh, NISO recommendation. Is there anything else? Um, can I request Martin from the Crossref team to take that one? Hi, everyone. Yeah, sure. So I'm Martin Eve. I'm principal R&D developer at Crossref, and I've been working on integrating the Retraction Watch data into our, our labs API, which is the sort of staging area and test bed for when we have new API features that we want to showcase to the community, but they're not quite ready to go into production yet. And I think I think Jeffrey actually typed the response to this that is basically what I'm going to say, which is that the idea of the Labs API is that it gives us scope to prototype new metadata representations and to give them to people to play with. We can't guarantee stability and uptime and performance on that API, but we can give you a flavor of how it could be designed. And that lets people feed back to us with, you know, this isn't good enough or I need it to do this. It's not doing it at the moment. So basically, there's a period now of community testing where people who want to use this can have a go um, can get in touch with us and tell us whether it's meeting their needs or not. And that will feed into our eventual design recommendations, for how we integrate this into the live production API. Um, a good example is the thing we've just been talking about, actually, that uh, there are schematic differences between what we have in cross-mark retractions at the moment and the richness of the retraction watch data that's come in. So, for instance, retraction watch provides us with a controlled vocabulary of reasons for retraction or expression of concern, which cross-mark was never able to handle. So if we want to represent that richness of data, 
we have to play around with new representations that will, in some senses, be incompatible with what we have at the moment, but hopefully are, are building on it. Um, and we've got some time to make that right before we move across to live. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for that. Um, we have uh, another question from Stephanie that says, um, is feet of play using AI to help flag potential problems prior to admin review? Um, can someone from the panelist volunteer to answer this one? I, I think um, the the, the co-creator of feet of play is, is uh, on this not on the panel, but um, is on the chat. So not to put him on the spot, but maybe he can uh, at least type an answer or something. But I don't know how that works. <laughs> I'm going to try and hit allow to talk. Perfect. Thanks, Jimmy. Wait a minute. Ah, got it. Guillaume, are you able to unmute and? Tell us more about this. Yeah. Hello. Is Hello. it working correctly? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thank you for uh, letting me uh, explain what the fit of clay is. It's not using AI at all. It's uh, only flagging those papers that cite retracted slash appeared papers uh, with uh, algorithms from the 1970s. So <laughs> no big game here. Um, yeah, and then the, the website shows these uh, papers or sometimes monographs that cite probably unreliable materials. And then we as a community flag these uh, papers that could be unreliable uh, on papier. And we expect the publishers to maybe reassess those papers that are not uh, flagged on papier or not retracted yet, but that uh, cite unreliable sources. Thank you. Can I just, I just want to uh, amplify uh, something there, Guillaume. Yeah, um, one, one thing is, first of all, I, I would really uh, recommend everyone from publishers to individuals to scholars, whichever, uh, take a look at the problematic paper screener, not just feet, feet of clay, but the rest of it is really amazing. Um, but it just, I think what, and Gam's answer, of course, was very crisp. The, one of the things that we at Retraction Watch uh, sort of like to underscore, in, in term, particularly in, in, using the, in using the data, is that there's actually a lot to do to clean up what is already out there. Um, and one of the, I, I would say, concerns that we've had is that um, people, particularly those who maybe have startups, AI startups, ML stars, whatever it is, have sort of, they've leapfrogged that. They've sort of like, oh, well, that's in the past and, and started creating these solutions, which yeah. may work one day. I'm very skeptical because I'm very skeptical of everything, but I would love to see them work. That being said, it actually doesn't take AI or ML, um, with all due respect to those amazing technologies, to do a lot of this work. And, and I think that there's a massive cleanup effort that is underway, uh, not as quickly as maybe a lot of us would like, but it's definitely underway that can actually accomplish a tremendous amount using simple old, as as Guillaume just said, you know, algorithms in the 1970s. I don't even know if you need algorithms, but I'm not a technical person, as a lot of people know. So I would just say, like, great to be excited about all that, and let's have those efforts moving forward, but let's not forget the efforts that uh, I think, frankly, this acquisition um, and integration will make possible in a way that, uh, you know, maybe that was part of what was slowing things down. I, I'd be the first to sort of acknowledge that, uh, the fact that we couldn't make it available and it hadn't made it available, but now it is. So great, let's, let's go. Thank you, Evan. Um, I'm not seeing, uh any other questions, but please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. But in the meantime, uh, I want to invite the panelists if they if there are any questions that they'd like to ask each other, if there's something else that anyone wants to bring up, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, I have a question. I, I'm not sure if it's for Ivan or Ed or, um, or who exactly, uh, but 
It's just regarding that differential um, in the list that Crossref already had and the one that Retraction Watch had, which is there's a, there's a big uh, difference in that list. And I think most of that is attributable to um, lack of reporting from from publishers and journals. And so to the extent that we that that you're able to measure that sort of going forward, because I my assumption is that we'll continue to fund the efforts that that the retraction watch team makes in finding all of these uh, more obscure retractions and corrections um, and feeding them into the Crossref system. But what we really like is for you know publishers and, and journals to take that responsibility and make sure that they're actually submitting that information to Crossref, right? So maybe there is an opportunity for a nudge there. Um, it, you know, Crossref does, has these other efforts in terms of like the completeness of the metadata is there something in, you know, could there be something in the works there on completeness of metadata around retractions uh, and perhaps expressions of concern as well? Yeah, so, so hi, thanks for the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in and just say, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's a very good point. We definitely want to, um, you know, there's a, a gap in what uh, publishers are sending us. So we our continuing efforts and uh, can use this opportunity saying we're getting this uh, great combination of data, but uh, uh, but we want uh, more publishers to be registering uh, the uh, retractions and corrections and, and other updates. You know, Crossref covers a wide range of updates, but uh, the um, but I but I think the key thing there is that it it can actually help. Then you still need the, the additional added value because, as Ivan noted before, publishers aren't. Uh, submitting metadata with the same taxonomy for the reasons for the retractions. Now that that could come in the future, but uh, you know, so I think for a while, uh, for the foreseeable future, obviously the two things combined are very good. But but obviously, if publishers are doing it, then at least the basic notification can certainly help uh, then uh, maintain and improve the database with that extra extra added value too on on top. Yeah, and does anybody else want to add anything? I don't know if Martin, do you want to say anything? I just wanted to add that at the moment, the way we've modeled this in the labs API is to show cross mark retractions alongside retraction watch retractions and have them specified as asserted by different parties. So what you start to build there is a triangulation of truth from different entities making the same assertion in multiple ways. Um, and we don't really want to lose that multiple perspective assertion, I think, because it, it just becomes a way of, of validating the strength of, of truth about that metadata. I think that would be that would be super. <laughs> what I can say is that uh, the the data right now is is just really really not consistent, um, and there there are a number of problems. Um, the the problems that I've seen in in the research that we've done recently, um, we pulled data in in April uh, 2023 from Crossref Retraction Watch Scopus Web of Science. The Crossref data that we pulled is 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 publicly available. You can find a link in the um, in the paper that we're presenting tomorrow. Um, so one problem from the publisher reported data that's been in Crossref is there's not a distinction uh, consistently made between the, the retracted publications and the retraction notices. If you look at the, the Crossmark updates data, those are, are both sometimes called, called retractions. That's one, one thing that, that does need cleaning up. Um, and we looked at at all the DOIs that we could um, that we could find in these four places, um, and and this just shows you know how many there are in each individual um, uh, data set that were you know DOIs that were um, that were there, and and then the intersections between them. And we found that even for um, for publications that were covered in in multiple um, sources, they they didn't necessarily always say they were retracted. Um, and you know we can't distinguish from the work that we've done so far. Does that mean that they aren't actually retracted and one place has it wrong? In the case of well, it's a retraction notice and you know whatever, um, or um, or something else, or is it that you know some places assert this is retracted, others assert that it's not? And we know that that um, many many people are are citing papers long after they're retracted, just like their regular papers. They don't appear to be able to tell that they're retracted. And that's a problem I really want us to fix. And I think this is for the um, 
and and this is and this is why this this data <laughs> availability is a dream come true because now everybody can integrate the best available data. Um, Ivan, you know, mentioned um, you know Allison Abridas who did her PhD about retraction, who's been curating this data, who really understands. Um, it's so hard for a normal everyday person um, to know what's retracted. Even even me looking at the the hand, uh, you know, we pulled like two hundred papers. Uh, 200 DOIs to look at um, for this and, and distinguishing, is this a retracted paper? It's often really, really challenging uh, to, to figure that out. We need to make it easier for end users to, to tell. Um, great, I, I um, actually wanna, I wanna say two things. One very quick, uh, and it sort of flipped, went by, and, and but Jody did mention it in her very first slide, I think, or one of her slides. 60% uh, of retractions are are in, I think you said engineering, which sort of broadly speaking, you know, maybe a different kinds of engineering, et cetera. I, I actually want to like sort of make sure that resonate or I, I hope it resonates. And one of the things that has happened over time is that people think that most retractions are in uh, biomedicine uh, in the life sciences. Um, now, uh, depending how you slice and dice the data, that's almost vaguely not really true, but uh, the perception comes from the fact that a lot of news outlets in particular, and, and including Retraction Watch for that matter, given what where Adam and I come from, uh, tend to over, not over cover those, but tend to focus on those. They're the ones people can understand. I mean, people don't understand a lot of the other stuff. But I, what I'm really hoping is that, you know, the, the availability of these data just sort of change that perception and, and just in many, many different ways, make every, the, thing, the thoughts we have about retraction actually be evidence-based, which Ours have changed over time because the data changed. But the reason I wanted to actually jump on just to say one sort of vaguely unrelated thing is um, there's been a little, I, I want to say confusion, but just sort of good questions about the role of, of Retraction Watch, the blog, um, which is really the journalism side of the Center for Scientific Integrity. And I, I just want to sort of underscore as the, you know, the notification, the, the announcement uh, did and other, other items and pieces have done, this acquisition actually has no effect on that. Uh, we will continue our work. In fact, it'll allow me to redouble some of my efforts on that work uh, and, and our whole team. Um, and so again, totally independent, uh, continue, again, continue the work, draw on the database the way everybody else in the world can, of course, um, but it is independent, uh, both in terms of integrity uh, and sort of, in, you know, sort of editorial independence and also financial. Independence. It's not at all related to, uh, to this acquisition. And I just want to underscore that, even though it's a little bit off topic. We are very close to time. So uh, I want to take one last question that has come in from the audience. Uh, it's about, would uh, Srinivas is asking, would works records have retraction flag going forward? Um, can I ask Rachel or Martin to take that one? Either either or. Why don't you start, Rachel? and, and uh, yeah, it's just, um, I think as Martin was saying, the the intention is to be able to, um, rather than sort of a flag to have that, I think you used the word, Martin, which is probably right, triangulation of the information that we have um, from our members related to works in the um, in the REST API, and then to be able to integrate the Retraction Watch information into that so that it's clear what information has come from the Crossref member who, again, and, you know, as we've said in 14,000 cases have made that assertion or that flag that the paper has, has been retracted. Um, and then said in uh, many other cases, it will be that that information is come from retraction watch. And in some cases it will be both. So integrating that into, for example, the, the works route in the rest API, as you said, is, it is definitely, something that we're going to work towards so that people can find all of the information related to work in in one place including those those updates um including retraction information i i just add that i think the thing we've learned over time is that api representations are complex things to design and getting them right takes a prototype it takes care and it takes a planning phase 
So we've got the opportunity now, now we have the retraction watch data to plan what that should look like in the live API and to work with the community who want to use it, to design that in a way that's most useful. But as Rachel says, what, what Crossref actually logs are assertions of metadata made by different parties. Sometimes it's the member itself, sometimes it's a third party like Retraction Watch, sometimes even a citation can be a type of assertion. So what we want to do is capture that richness and then let people decide for themselves on how those add up to a truth about the metadata. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we have a little bit less than 10 minutes before we end this. So um, as a final question, I want to ask everyone about what what is that one thing that you'd like to see change in the way we as a whole community manage correcting and updating the scholarly record? Um, can I begin with you, Jennifer? Uh, certainly. Thank you. Um, it should happen more quickly. Thanks. Um, can I go to you, Chris, next? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you can. Um, I like the first suggestion. I um, think that I want the emerging specialism, uh, profession, if you like, and community that's dedicated to doing research integrity to be properly recognized and supported and enabled to do the great work that they do. Thank you, thank you for that, Chris. Um, Michelle would love to have your thoughts as well. Yeah, mine is, has already been spoken about a little bit here, but just um, maybe this is an opportunity to rethink our approach to classifying retractions um, because that word is really stigmatized, uh, conceals a multitude of sins and a range of causes from you know, innocent errors to outright fraud. And that nuance is already captured in some extent in, in the, the Retraction Watch database. But, um, you know, I think this is an opportunity to further refine it, really codify it um, in Crossref's metadata. I, that's, I would be really happy to see that happen. Despite all the diff, all the uh, challenges, Ivan, that, uh, you know, that you're right to bring up. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, can I ask Jody next? Please use this data, publishers, right, of every sort. Please check what's retracted. Make sure we can tell. Um, and please keep an eye out. Um, as, as Rachel mentioned, uh, the NISO CREC working group will be putting out display standards, metadata standards in draft form in about two weeks. And we will really want feedback to make sure that these ideas of how to surface retractions and corrections uh, and, and expressions of concern everywhere are, are realistic. But let's make that happen. It will make a huge difference to the integrity of the Scully record. Thank you, Jody. Um, Rachel, I invite you for some of your final thoughts on this question and if there's anything else you want to add. No, I, I think um, what a lot of people have said, and I think, you know, Michelle, you just said it in your sort of final comments is that, as you said, the the this is something that you know that we should be like that we should be sharing openly we should bringing be bringing and working towards bringing increased transparency to this and um, to this information and I think there's a lot of will out there to to do so um so I I'm looking forward to yeah I'm looking forward to see sort of where we go from here Thank you, Rachel. Um, Ivan, any final thoughts from you and any suggestions on what we as a community can do better at uh, managing this? Yeah, no, I, I think I, I agree with everything that uh, has been suggested. I, I, I'll i sort of maybe say two things. One is I would love to hear, um, and not, I mean, certainly if we have time, any of the panelists or anyone else uh, suggest ways that uh, we can improve the database. Um, uh, you know, there are things that are happening. Uh, Martin and team are working on, you know, sort of some of the technological, technical aspects. Um, but what about the data, right? We're actually at this point where 
one of the things this acquisition has uh, allowed us to do is actually to bring on more help. Uh, we have been able to convert a uh, freelancer who was helping Allison, uh, who in who Allison trained, to full time. Uh, excuse me, he's not he's not full time, but he's he's an employee. He's an actual proper staffer, uh, working uh, you know I think thirty hours a week. Um, that's great, and it means that there's just more bandwidth, and it's, it's part of one of the benefits of this is again of this acquisition. So, what would the community like to see? Um, is it a uh, different kind of metadata? Is it um, different uh, so organization, taxonomy? I, it's beyond me, actually, to, to be able to think about all that because it's the community that we want to drive that. The second thing I'd say is I, I, I completely agree, of course, with let's destigmatize the correction and refraction process. I, I, um, we've been arguing for that literally since day one of, of Retraction Watch. Um, I, I would sort of go even further upstream. And I think that we need to be thinking much more about the metrics that we're using, whether it's funders, whether it's universities, et cetera. Um, because a lot of the reason why this process is so stigmatized is because of the incredibly large sort of the outsized, um, you know, nature sort of a, a metric that paper publishing papers, certainly particularly in certain journals, has uh, in in sort of people's uh, CVs and in their their whole careers. And like, I'm sympathetic to that, but let's let's also think about not just again, cleaning things up, which is what their attraction and correction process is an attempt to do, but how to you know encourage a lot of the behavior that you heard about earlier, uh, you know, depositing data, um, that kind of behavior, uh, open open uh, science, open efforts, um, and, and again, incentivizing correction of the record. Thank you so much, Ivan. I want to thank all of our wonderful panelists today for all of their time um, and for sharing their valuable insights with each one of us. I want to thank all the audience who joined us for this. Um, and just thanks to everyone. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>